good morning. We welcome you to our nine o'clock worship. We welcome you to our nine o'clock worship this morning. Thank you for being here to praise God this hour on a special day for our families. Happy Mother's Day to everyone, but mostly we're here to celebrate our Heavenly Father. If you have not filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that. There are some in the pews in front of you. You can pass that to an aisle. We'll have some gentlemen pick those up in just a moment. Uh, as we uh, continue to come out of uh, COVID, we actually have a member still sick with COVID this morning, so uh, it's not gone from the earth, uh, unfortunately. But uh, as, we, uh, as we do recover from that, uh, our crowds are increasing, and I just wanted to slip a word into the members here. If you're able-bodied and uh, can walk across from uh, the lot behind Regents Bank, consider parking over there and letting our older members have this lot beside the, beside the church. A lot of street parking, but we also, uh, as you will recall, purchased this lot uh, across the street. Uh, and so uh, tons of parking over there. If you're able-bodied and able to uh, to make that walk across the street, we'd appreciate it. It does free up some spots here close by the building. Um, great day to be together as a family of God. Thank you for being here. As we begin our worship this morning, the uh, first song is uh, "Blessed Assurance," probably one of the one of the most well-known songs in the song hymnal. If you look at it in the book, you'll notice that the songwriter was Fanny J. Crosby, who lived 1820 to 1915. She was one of the most prolific songwriters in the history of Christianity. Over 8,000 hymns this lady wrote. And the, the verse, uh, one of the verses this song is based on comes from 1 John 5. Uh, if you'd like to, let's stand for the reading of this verse and then the song and a couple of songs, actually. 1 John 5 Verse 13, John wrote, I have written you these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. You who keep trusting in the person and the power of the Son of God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, my Lord, takes the glory mine. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord of all lives, King of the universe, we come before you humbly, thanking you for all the blessings you brought in our lives. Thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for letting us gather here safely to worship and praise your name. And Father, we thank you most importantly for all the mothers in our lives. Father, lift them up, bless them, bless all of us according to your will, Father. Forgive us the wrongs we do and help us to forgive others that wrong us. Watch over, protect us, keep us safe. Protect this nation, Father, bless its leaders. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Oh. Supper, I wanted to read a few verses from the book of 1 Peter. You might, you might follow along if you have your Bible with you. One of just a, four different little short passages. First one is in 1 John chapter or 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. I'll be li- reading from the New Living Translation. It says, You love him even though you have never seen him. 
Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, he talks about Christ giving his life for us. He says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you've come to trust in God and you've placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you were healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. And finally, chapter 3, verse 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. This morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and we ponder these thoughts of, of Christ giving his life for us, his blood for us, dying on the cross for us, being raised up uh, on the first day uh, of the week after that. As we ponder these things, these aren't, this, is, this is, isn't something we just come together and do and then move on to the next thing. We take these thoughts, we take these this idea through with us through this entire next week. So let's pray together now as we give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, as we have just heard once again from Scripture that you, your love for us is beyond our imaginings, is beyond our understanding. And you gave something so precious for each one of us that Jesus went to the cross and gave us life for us. His, his body was broken for us. And Father, as we at this time remember and, and reset in our minds and, and think back to that cross and, and put ourselves there at the foot of the cross and, and see the love that he had for us, Father, help us to, to remember through the eye of faith what you've done for us. Father, this morning as we take this bread, we pray that we do it in a way that brings honor and glory to you, and as we take it, we remember the body broken for us, the body of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was paid with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Let's pray once again. Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we again turn to you and Thank you, praise you for your love and your wonderful power. Father, we uh, turn our minds back to the cross. And once again, as we have just read from Scripture, it wasn't with some uh, gold or silver or, or money but in any way that, that paid for our salvation. It was the blood of Jesus. Something that is so precious we can't, we can't wrap our minds around it. And Father, this morning as we drink this cup, which reminds us of the blood that was shed for us. We know that it was shed for the entire world, but, but individually we realize also it was shed for us. And Father, as we take of this, help us to examine our own lives to consider the direction of our life, to consider our need and our dependence on you, and to truly be thankful for what you have done for us. And may it, may it show itself, our, our gratitude show itself in our lives. Father, now as we take this cup, help us to remember and to reflect. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs>
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for letting us take a part in this uh, ceremony that we just did, in this remembrance supper that we just did. We pray now that as we have this opportunity to purpose in our hearts to give back a portion that you blessed us with, that we will do so cheerfully. In Christ's name. Thankful for the opportunity to share a few moments 
Uh, Mark, we appreciate you helping us to join our voices to praise our great God. Uh, this is a special day, as all Lord's days are special, but it has an extra little specialness uh, to all of us just because of our mothers. I want to share a passage with you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, beginning with verses 7 and 8. And the reason that I share this passage, this is not necessarily the text uh, for our study this morning and for our thoughts, but I'm just mindful of how Paul, when he thinks about this church at Thessalonica, the imagery that he brings to the hearts of those people there, and even for us uh, a little over 2,000 years later, he uses uh, the language that we're all familiar with. He says, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our, li our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Now, think about this. Paul's wanting to send this special message to the church in Thessalonica, and of all of the things that he could have mentioned about this relationship and his love, his care for them, we realize that he kind of goes back to the way a mother has love for her children. And that's what he uses to talk about his love for this wonderful church. I just think that that is uh, such a beautiful way of expressing love. We think about the love from our own mothers. We think about how they have taken care of us. They've had compassion on us. Uh, they've had mercy on us, but unconditionally loving us. But not only that, we also think about not Paul, but Christ. Christ as well displayed this kind of love for his followers then. He displays this kind of love for us today where he sacrificially and unconditionally gives himself. Isn't that what mothers do? And so we think about just his life in general and how uh, he must have had a great example before him and Mary. I don't think it was just that he randomly decided I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to serve and I'm going to love unconditionally. I believe he saw that firsthand. He saw that in real life in Mary. I'm also reminded of the illustration of a junior high school teacher. I love this one because he was talking one day about magnets. And for the entire class period, he talked about the properties of magnets. And so the next day, he decided that he would give a pop quiz to his class about what he had talked about the day before. And so the question that he had, uh, for the first question of the quiz was this. My name begins with an M. It has six le uh, letters, and I pick up things. <laughs> Half the class answered with the word mother. As you can imagine, totally missing magnets. But isn't that true? There's an old Spanish proverb that says, an ounce of a mother is worth more than a pound of clergy. I think that's so appropriately stated as well. But you think about it in the Bible, we get some of the best portraits of motherhood. Yeah, we can open up the pages of our Bibles and God gives us so many beautiful uh, things within the pages that he has recorded for us. But one of the most beautiful things that he does is he shares portrait after portrait of mothers. Think about Moses' mother. Think about King Solomon's mother. Uh, well, not his mother, a mother who came to King, King Solomon, who was willing to give her son up uh, to another woman to save his life. And then think about uh, those of James and John, the mother of James and John. You know, I, this reminds me I, of my own mom. I think if my mom were living today, she would be saying, now, Lord, if you could, just let Charles be at his right hand, at your right hand. Uh, that's the way she was when I was playing sports. You know, I never did anything wrong. The coaches were always, uh, uh, I never did anything wrong. The coaches were never right, you know. That's the way it goes with moms. But I think about those two boys, and I think about their mom, and I, I kind of picture my mom there. But I think about King Lemuel. You realize King Lemuel wrote or penned some of the best words in all of Scripture in Proverbs 31 when he talks about the virtuous 
uh, wife, the virtuous woman, who he was inspired by his own mother to write. Such beautiful pictures, such beautiful portraits in Scripture of motherhood. Uh, our attention will be turned to a special mother and a special grandmother. Uh, you might remember Eunice and Lois in Scripture who were uh, Timothy's grandmother and mother. And it's interesting, again, because of all of the people that Paul could talk about in the church and of all the things that he could write about and all of the experiences that he had in life, he chose at, at this moment, uh, as he's pinning the words to Timothy and 1 Timothy, to talk about his grandmother and his mother and the impact that they had on his faith. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. You know, you think about uh, Eunice. She was raised in a godly home and was a, a, a great woman of faith, but she was impacted by her mother Lois. And Lois, too, would uh, be one who would be committed to God, committed to the wonderful Word of God, and would teach that uh, wonderful Word uh, and pass it on down to her daughter, her son, our grandson. But you might remember that uh, she became a mother and she ultimately passed it down to Timothy. Timothy, we have two letters in our Bibles written to Timothy. I mean, he's just not some casual person in the church that no one really knew, uh, no one had a clue about. No, here is a great young man of faith. But I want you to know he didn't become that way on his own. He had a great example before him. He had two great examples before him, and they were both women. You know, as Timothy grew in his love for Jesus, as we know from Scripture, he becomes one of the uh, most impressive disciples of Christ in all of the Word of God. As a matter of fact, it was the wonderful environment provided for him, for him by his grandmother and his mother that helped provide the backdrop for what we have in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. If you want to open your Bibles and read there with me, here's Paul saying, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, and without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. Now he's writing this letter to young Timothy. He says, I remember you uh, every night and every day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance, now get this, when he thinks about Timothy, who does he think about? Only Timothy? No, he says, I think about the genuineness of your faith, yes, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I'm reminded, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want you to think about how they imparted this beautiful faith to their grandson and son Timothy. And think about the impact of this faith on the Lord's church, and on people that would follow afterwards. Such a tremendous young man of faith that first began, began in a grandmother and in a mother. I want you to think about this. For example, you've got uh, Lois who has believed in God, who has committed her heart to the Old Testament. Think about how many times she had uh, read that Old Testament and had read those prophecies about Jesus. Think about how she passed that faith on down to her uh, daughter, Eunice. And how, as a result, that faith was combined to ultimately be passed down to a grandson, a son. Um, such a beautiful story here. Believing in the promises, committing themselves to the Old Testament prophecies of Jesus. You know, when Jesus came, many people missed it. Many people missed him. The religious rulers of the day, the ones who should have known first and foremost who Jesus was, completely missed him. But not these two. No, they took to heart the scriptures that they were studying. They gave their allegiance to the God that they had committed their hearts and lives to. And as a result, they passed this faith on down to their son, grandson, so that when Jesus did come, they recognized him and they loved him. As a matter of fact, uh, as we think about this particular story, 
I think about these two ladies as they commit to Jesus ultimately and as they commit their son to Jesus and to ministry. There's a couple of things that just sort of come to mind that just jump out at us from this text. I think first and foremost, we need to, uh, all of us, not just our mothers, although I, I am using two ladies to give us a lesson today, this is true for all of us. Develop a love for God's Word. Uh, how many of you have kids? Raise your hands in here. You had kids. How many of you have grandkids? Yeah, still some hands up, right? I, I, I will tell you there's no precious sight for your children to see than for you with an open Bible. Loving God's Word, pouring your heart into it, listening to God as He communicates through His Word. Develop a love for Jesus and for His Word. As a matter of fact, as we think about this, it didn't just happen by chance. It wasn't just that uh, Lois and Eunice said, okay, Timothy, we want you to go study your Bible. No, no, it was, it was in them personally first. And I think that that's what we have to remember, to develop a personal faith, a personal love for God and for His Word. You know, we've seen it on numerous occasions, right? We will tell our children to do something, and then at times they won't do it, and you know, they see in us not doing that same thing. We have generated a phrase, haven't we, about that? Do as I say and... Yeah, not as I do. Well, the Bible, we want to understand, it's not, it's not for our kids only. Let, let them see it in us personally. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, we're told that everyone who desires to live godly in this present age will suffer persecution. Now, Paul writes that to Timothy. And I want you to think about how this Word of God, how it, how it transformed Timothy's life, how it gave him assurance of knowing that God is a very real and present help in time of need. I, I want you to see that, that in that Word of God that, that, that Timothy learned to uh, trust in God and learned to depend on Him. He was his shield and his strength. He was his source of courage. As a matter of fact, in that passage in 2 Timothy 3, beginning with verse 14, you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of. Now, let's just stop there. I want you to understand that the things that Timothy had learned, the assurance that he had gotten was from the Old Testament. Like all of those precious promises, all of that word of encouragement, all of that, that courage that was supposed to well up in the heart of the child of God, Timothy had learned in the Old Testament. We're not talking about the New Testament here. And he had learned that from his grandmother and from his mother. But think about how, as Paul writes this letter, and we have it recorded in our New Testament, that he makes reference to the fact that what you studied a long time ago will be the assurance that you will have in some very difficult moments as you continue to live your faith out in Jesus Christ. He would go on to say that... Uh, the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. You know, how, can you, how many of you can remember precious moments years gone by when you, sat when you sat teaching your children and your grandchildren the wonderful Word of God? I want to tell you, as the Bible communicates, that Word will not return to God void. It will have impact. Now, the beautiful thing about our life is we have free will, right? We have the ability to make our own choices and our own decisions, but it's that Word of God that has the ability to continue to come up and creep up in our hearts and our minds when we need it the most. Maybe when we need that voice of reason telling us, don't do that. No, you need to go in this direction. You need to follow this path. Or maybe it's that reassurance of saying, I am with you always even in these difficult moments, or as many of us need that moment of forgiveness. I will forgive you as far as the east is from the west. So far have I removed your transgressions from me. It's those holy scriptures that helped to pour into Timothy's heart and helped him to be the man that he would become. Going on in this verse, which are able to build you up and to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly equipped 
for every good work. You want to know what will help you and me in this life? It's right here. And we read about Timothy, and he had that Old Testament embedded deep within his heart because he had a grandmother and a mother who were committed to God and committed to following his word. Think about what Timothy would have heard in his life about how maybe it's Deuteronomy chapter 6 where he is uh, rec uh, re remembering those words about loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or maybe it's Leviticus 19 verse 18 where he's remembering to love our neighbor as ourself. And just think about that. Those two thoughts, those two foundational principles would be part of Timothy's life and his heritage and ultimately would be the reason that he's living the life of faith that he is living. You know, people argue about translations. How many of you have a different translation this morning? Some of you have King James. Some of you have New King James. Some of you have NIV or ESV and or one of the V's, you've got some version, right? Someone said, well, people argue about translations, and I'll tell you that the one people read the most is the one that you're living. And how true is that? I think the second thing we think about and focus on when we remember uh, uh, Timothy is not only to develop a, a, a love for God's Word, but also to demonstrate a life of faith. You know, uh, again, I, I will say it's easy to tell our kids, hey, you go on that mission trip. It's easy to tell our kids, you go on that retreat. It's so easy and, 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 and very peaceful, mind you, when they do. <laughs> right? It's easy to tell them to do all of that stuff. And it's a totally different thing to walk beside them in those moments, helping them along that with that demonstration of faith. You see, that's the thing we learned from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I want you to notice what Paul says as he's writing this letter to young Timothy. He says, when I call to remembrance the genuineness of the faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it is in you also. The genuineness of your faith. He's not talking about words on a page now. He's talking about what is seen in life. He's talking about our words and our actions. He's talking about how we respond to people and how we respond when people respond or communicate with us. That's what's noticeable about our faith. How we love people and how we treat people and how we respond to people matter. As a matter of fact, that word genuine, I think I've used this here before. I've shared this with you. But that word, some of you have the word genuine in your translation. Some have the word sincere faith. And that word is an interesting word. It, it sort of paints a picture, if you will. So you can imagine with all of the different things that would be sold in the marketplace, there would be uh, pottery and things like that that would be handmade. Well, they would they would, it was arduous work, and they would spend a lot of time crafting this beautiful piece of art. And then let's just say, for example, it's knocked over or it's broken or chipped, and so... They had a crafty way of kind of covering that up so no one could see it. What they would do is they would take wax and they would melt it over that crack or they would kind of take some wax and, and kind of form it around as it would start to cool, a place that chipped. And then they would just paint it up and it would look like the genuine article until something would happen and you would see that it was really broken or fragile. And, and, and what's interesting is Paul uses that same word to describe that same process to say, let's be genuine, let's be sincere. Now, let's understand, we're all broken. We're, we're all fragile. Every one of us are sinful. There's not, no one in here is exempt from that. But let's be genuine about our faith. Let's not be fake. Uh, the word would also give the idea of being unhypocritical. Let's be unhypocritical with our faith. Do you know the number one reason why people do not go to church? Or at least as stated by most people who don't go to church. They don't, they don't go to church because they know someone, and in their own words, who is a hypocrite. Our actions matter, not only to our family, but they matter to the people of our community. They really let what, the, let what is in the heart be made known. So let's not be sincere. Uh, let's not be unhypocritical. Let's be sincere. Let's not be hypocritical 
Let's be sincere. I'll get it right. Say, that preacher told us just to be hypocritical. <laughs> well, let's get that right, okay? And so, so think about that. Think about the moments. How, have you thought about the moments that you spend with your children in a day? Sometimes it could seem like days all in one day, right? But think about how they see us respond. Every one of us. Not, not, this is not only for mothers. This is every one of us. How they respond to difficult, stressful moments. I mean, let's be honest, parents. How many of you have literally lost your mind in front of your kids? Yeah. Yeah, it happens. It happens, doesn't it? It happens to all of us. And I want you to think that, that uh, Lois and Eunice are perfect. I mean, I'm sure they had those moments as well. I mean, they're raising a young boy named Timothy, Right? I mean, think about the moments where discipline had to be had to come into play and the moments of frustration when he didn't do what his mother or what his grandmother had told him to do. But but it's that genuine faith that keeps coming like cream to the top. I think about what they would have instilled in their child and it would be that they were more interested in his soul than in anything else. His eternity is what matters. Uh, Christy used to say about our kids and even our, our three that are in our home now would say about all of our kids, you know, we're just trying to get them to heaven, not to Harvard. You know, I mean, you know, we're, we're, it's not about rocket science in our house. We're just, we're just trying to get to heaven. Now, if they make it to Harvard, that's great. But we're trying to get them to heaven. And I think that should be the mentality that everyone has is to help us. That's what we see to help, help us to get them to heaven. That's what we see and this wonderful grandmother and mother. And I want you to think about it. You're here today to honor your mother. And I want you to think about what Timothy would have seen in his mother and in his grandmother. That they were more interested in prayer and worship and service and godliness more than anything else in life. You don't just randomly have a young man like Timothy without great examples before him. As a matter of fact, I think about the kingdom, the church, the eternal kingdom that would have no end, the kingdom that they were interested in, the kingdom that they had read about in the Old Testament, the kingdom that Jesus would come and establish, the kingdom that would be a part, uh, a holy nation, God's own special people, that kingdom that Paul would write in Ephesians would be the church, the body of Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. That's the kingdom they were committed to. They were actively involved in that kingdom. Demonstrate, demonstrate a life of faith. And ultimately, you can talk about faith and you can talk about God's word, but if you never have a commitment to Jesus, in, in all seriousness, what does it matter? Jesus is all that matters. He's the reason for Genesis and He's the reason for Revelation. He's the reason for everything in the middle. That love that you have for God's Word will take you to Jesus. That faith that we talked about that was lived out was lived out for Jesus. We must be determined to lead them to Jesus. Now, we take them to a lot of places, don't we? Uh, we'll take them to practice, and, and, and we'll take them to all kinds of events. We'll take them everywhere in the world. But I will tell you the most important place for you to take your children is to Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 1, <coughs> then he came to Der Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. And this is the man we've been talking about. The son of a Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. <coughs> And, he, and Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and he had, he had him circumcised because of the, Jew, of the Jews who were in that region. I, I just want to stop here and think about this for just a moment. Now, circumcision is a Jewish thing, right? And here's Timothy, young Timothy, who's grown up in a home where it's divided, right? There's some allegiance to uh, God. And his father, being Greek, would have an allegiance to maybe multiple gods. And I don't want to go into all of that other than to say 
that regardless of what home life is like, Jesus can make a difference. Now, I want you to think about this because, because here is a home that's divided. And I'm not talking about Alabama and Tennessee. Right? I mean, the right one will always win out, right? Didn't say which one was right, but just said it will always win out. You know, a house divided against itself can't stand. But here's a house that is divided. And Jesus makes the difference here. I mean, so much so that when Paul is wanting to go further in ministry, he takes this young man who's grown up in a half-Greek home, who's grown up with an understanding of paganism. And what he does is he takes him and has him circumcised. That tells me that the power and influence of Jesus in the home can make a difference. Uh, as a matter of fact, in verse 2, just to mention this again, I already read this, but he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Jesus had made a difference in Timothy's life, so much so that churches were talking about him. But anyway, Paul takes him and he has him circumcised. And as they, were, as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the, the decrees to, uh, to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. That's referring back to Acts 15. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. Why did that happen? It happened, yes, because of Paul, a wonderful man of faith, but it also happened because of Timothy and the influence of the women behind his life. You know, a lot of times we talk about, and I don't, again, I'm not claiming to not think I have the answers or know why Paul mentions the things that he mentions in Scripture. But had Paul not told us about uh, Lois and Eunice, how in the world would we know about Timothy's strong faith as having been passed down from these two godly women? We, we would have no way of knowing that. I have to just believe for a moment that there are a lot of people working out. Behind the scenes. Helping people to come to faith. Helping churches to be strong. Helping people to continue to love Jesus and do the best that they can in this world filled with sin and sickness. And those women behind the scenes are literally moving the church. Now again, we talk about preachers and we talk about missionaries and we talk about all of the good things that people like Paul and others have done. And not to in any way disqualify that or to diminish it. But I don't think that we can stand as though we've got some corner market on courage, men. You think about the cross. And you think about mainly the people that Scripture mentions who are there. And you know the majority of the people who were surrounding Jesus were women. I think that's powerful and never can be underestimated or overlooked. Thank you for your courage and for your faith and for what you do here in this place. It matters. It mattered to Timothy. It mattered to the early church. It mattered to Jesus Christ. And the basis and foundation of that faith started in the home with two wonderful women who had a love for the Word of God, who lived out their faith before this young man, and who helped him to see Jesus. That made a difference. That is powerful. I thank you for your presence today. I'm thankful for your encouragement. I'm thankful for joining your hearts and minds in this service today. But please don't leave here without expressing a word of gratitude to the women who have made this place stronger. Mark's going to lead us in a song. I, I, I know we all have uh, stressed over the last few days, maybe some last minute, about what we're going to do for mom for Mother's Day. Okay, I, I, I get that. I, I'm one of those, right? Trying to do the right thing just, just at the right moment. But I'll tell you, I will tell you there's no greater gift that your mom wants to see 
than for you to be present with the Lord and to be faithfully walking by Him. And if you need to step out in faith this morning, there's not a greater thing that she wants than for your commitment to be given to Jesus Christ. If you need to do that this morning, we encourage you to come. As together we stand. that have taken ownership of them, individuals that mean so much to them through birth, through love, and through baptism. We thank you, Father, for bringing these women in our lives that it means so much that they can reach down and touch in so many different ways. And above all, that they will each the salvation of your son and the great blessings he's bestowed upon us in the gift of eternal life. As we continue today, we pray, Father, that you'll touch our hearts and our souls with your message each and every day. And Father, that we will reach out and touch those around us with the message of your Son, his love, his forgiveness, and his sacrifice, and the blessing of eternal life. 
Many are suffering, Father, right now because of various illnesses, both spiritual illness, physical illness, and mental illness. They're facing difficulties. We pray, Father, that we can touch their hearts and help them in some way. And help us as each Christians to love each other, that we know how to touch their heart and how we can uplift them. Thank you, Father, for giving your Son. May we celebrate his life, his death, and his resurrection this week with everyone around us and may know that we truly are sons and children of God. Thank you. Give us blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.